I'm here in the city that's now called St Albans, named after England's first martyr. But it used to be the Roman town of Verulamium, here at the bottom of the hill. One day's walk for the Roman soldiers who were marching north from London. You can see the ruins of the city walls around us here in the park. And if you go to the village of Capernaum in the north of Israel, you can see another set of ruins from about the same period in another corner of the Roman Empire. These are the excavations they have done on the site of St. Peter's home. There's a large room in the center. The foundations are still visible. And you can imagine Jesus sitting there with his first disciples, with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Mary Magdalene and the other women who had grown close to him, with his mother Mary, his cousins, friends and neighbours from the local villages. From the outside, this is just a group of people meeting for a meal. But from the inside, this is the beginning of the church. It's the community that Jesus gathered around him, sharing his life with them, teaching them, praying with them, the conversation and the laughter, and sometimes the disagreements and the tears. Christianity was never about just believing in Jesus. It was also about belonging to his church and being brought into this new community and this new way of life. At the beginning of human history, God created us to love one another and to share in his own divine love. We were made to live in unity and peace. And even when this unity was shattered by sin, God was determined to put things right. It was an incredible work of restoration over thousands of years. He chose the Jewish people to know his love in a special way. He sent them prophets and leaders he gave them a pattern of worship, a moral code, and a set of sacred scriptures. And in the fullness of time, he sent his son, Jesus, to be their savior. Jesus would gather all people, not just the Jews, into a new community of salvation. This is the church. God is fixing human history and putting things right. He is restoring the unity and peace that we lost in the Garden of Eden. It's amazing when you start to connect the plans that unfold in the New Testament with the promises that God made in the Old Testament. Why did Jesus choose 12 apostles? because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the church is the place where all people from every nation and race and language can become one people in Christ. Why did Jesus go up the mountain to instruct his disciples? Because he was teaching them in the same way that God taught Moses on top of Mount Sinai. And so the teaching of the church becomes a gift for all people and not just for the Jews. Why did Jesus offer his life in sacrifice on the cross? Because this sacrifice was a fulfillment of all the worship and sacrifice that had ever been offered in the Old Testament. And the worship of the Christian church allows us to share in this offering until the end of time. Imagine these people sitting with Jesus in St. Peter's home in Capernaum. Imagine the same group of people in Jerusalem a few years later, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples at Pentecost. This is not just a random community. They are united by their love for Jesus Christ and their desire to share his love with others. This unity was part of God's plan for the human race from the very beginning. 
I know that many people today are suspicious of institutions and authority. They see that the church has made many mistakes. They feel it's better to rely on themselves and find their own way. I can understand that instinct. But the church, even with all its weaknesses, is meant to lead us to Jesus. And it's equally true that Jesus leads us to his church. It's his family, his community. He is like a shepherd gathering his sheep into one flock. You can try to follow Jesus without the help of his church, but if you keep following him faithfully, you'll discover that he is leading you to know and love his church.